Okay, so good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Center for Labor Studies. Um, I'll just take a few moments to introduce our speaker today. Um, it is a privilege uh, to have uh, Michael Heinrich with us today. Um, he is, for you, for those who do not know, uh, he teaches economics at Berlin and is also uh, an editor in Procla Journal for uh, Critical Social Science. He is also uh, the author of uh, books such as uh, the, the Science of Value, um, with, with the subtitle Marxist Critique of Political Economy Between Scientific uh, um, be, uh, Between uh, Political Economy and um, um, Scientific um, be Realism. Between. Between scientific revolution and oh, classical yeah, that, tradition. That, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, he's also an author of an introduction to the three volumes of uh, Karl, Karl Marx's Capital, uh, which will be available in Croatian translation yeah, till the end of this year. Uh, <laughs> the end? <laughs> Months. Months, that is. Uh, uh, today he will have we, he will have two lectures. Uh, the first one, um, value fetishism and impersonal domination, uh, here at Mama, and then the second lecture at uh, eight o'clock uh, under the title the bourgeois state uh, class domination of the uh, uh, on the basis of freedom and uh, equality, um, and that will be uh, that that will be held at the Faculty of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences. Now. Uh, I, I, I would like to thank, our, uh, first of all, our comrades at uh, MAMA for um, allowing us uh, to have this um, space uh, for, for this lecture. And uh, also uh, our sponsors, um, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung L, uh, in Belgrade, uh, for their um, moral and material support. Um, yeah, before we begin, um, we have we have uh, this list of participants that we, we would like you to sign. This is for our sponsors so that they, they can check uh, who is coming to these, these kinds of lectures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the lecture will last uh, approximately 45 minutes to one hour. And after that, we have, I think, enough time for questions and comments and uh, hopefully productive discussion. So without any further ado, I hope that, I, that you received all this information that I've <coughs> sent. And um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. And also thank you very much for the invitation to uh, speak here. Um, I want to, to speak about value theory, about Marxian value theory. and. Uh, um, when we speak about this issue, there is a traditional view uh, in which this issue seems to be rather easy, rather simple. There is a labor theory of value uh, already formulated by Adam Smith and David Ricardo. Marx uh, accepts uh, this labor theory of value and um, brings it to a, to a peak. Maybe he's uh, the top uh, guy in, in this list. But essentially, uh, very often it is seen as a kind of unity. Smith, uh, Ricardo, Marx, uh, they had essentially the same uh, labor theory of value, which nowadays is opposed uh, to a marginal utility theory uh, of value. But this very simple uh, view is uh, not at all uh, correct. On the one hand, uh, when you read carefully Smith and Ricardo, you can see that there is not just one labor uh, theory of value which tells us labor creates value. There, the things are more complicated, but unfortunately today my issue is Marx and not uh, Smith and Ricardo. Therefore, I will not go in depth uh, in, in this point. I just mention it also with the classical economists. It is not so easy with uh, labor theory of value. 
What I will stress is that Marx is not just a representative of the labor theory of value. By the way, he never mentioned this term. He never speaks of labor theory of value. He only speaks of value theory. Uh, so I want to stress that Marx is not just a representative. In some respect, he is a critic of this classical labor theory of value, but because uh, at, since the end of the 19th century we have this big conflict between objective labor theory of value on the one hand, utility theories on the other hand, the differences, the critique of Marx against uh, Smith and Ricardo is uh, underestimated. And I want to to highlight these differences in order to, uh, to highlight uh, certain aspects of Marx uh, value theory, which are already mentioned in the title of uh, the lecture, uh, Fetishism and Impersonal Rule. So, what are now the, the differences? What are now the, the big uh, achievements of Marx value theory? At first, and this maybe is not uh, questioned very much, there is a difference in scope. Uh, when you read Smith and Ricardo, what, what is for them the interesting point, what they want to understand, it is uh, they, they want to explain the quantitative exchange relations why um, commodity A exchanges with commodity B in, in a relation two, uh, um, uh, two times A against one time B. Marx's scope, uh, when he speaks about value theory, is not just um, a quantitative exchange relation. Marx's uh, scope of interest, of analysis, is much deeper. He understands value theory as a social theory, a, a theory which explains us how a society or an, an economy can work in which, on the one hand, the, the producers are dependent on each other because of the division of labor, but on the other hand, these producers behave as if they were uh, lonesome Robinsons. They, uh, they produce privately, independently uh, from each other. So what is this, and, and when we are so used to this, that um, maybe we, we not even see how crazy this situation is that you, on the one hand, depend on each other, but on the other hand, you negate, you ignore this, uh, this dependence. So, uh, when Marx speaks of value theory, it is not just a limited economic theory, it is a, a theory or a consideration how this kind of economy and society is possible. It exists, but how is this possible? So this, his value theory is already, by, by this different scope, a part of his critical project. When you read Capital, you should uh, take uh, care of the subtitle of the book. It's not only capital. The subtitle, subtitle is Critique of Political Economy. Political economy in these times was just the usual term for economics, or what we call nowadays economics, economic uh, uh, sciences. And when Marx uh, uses the subtitle Critique of Political Economy, then this means that he not just criticized uh, certain theories, he criticized, or he made at least the attempt to criticize, a whole science. 
And how can you criticize a whole science and not only a, a single theory? You criticize a whole science uh, in so far you put into question what is taken for granted in this science. <laughs> what is taken so much for granted that it seems not even necessary to discuss it or to, to give reason for this. And this critical project in, in Marx starts already with value theory. In the first chapter of Capital, about the commodity, uh, Marx uh, gives us a, a very um, valuable um, consideration on this. In this section, on, in this su subsection on fetishism, he writes that the classical political economy more or less correctly found the content of the form of the, co uh, of the commodity, meaning they found that the value is determined by labor. But, he added then, they, the classical political economists, they never asked why this content, labor, takes this form, value. They take this for granted. Why they did take this for granted? Because they take commodity production for granted. And Marx doesn't take commodity production for granted. He takes it as a special social form which has to be analyzed as such a special form. And this starts with uh, his value theory. In so far, to say Marx has a different scope in his value theory, he not only wants to, to explain quantitative uh, um, exchange relations, but he sees it as a social theory, is already a basic critic to this uh, uh, science of political economy. And not only uh, the, the point that he had uh, a different scope. But his, um, his, that he puts in, in question such basic uh, things is not restricted to the scope. The next point he puts in question is labor itself. It is well known that Adam Smith um, as an answer to the question what determines the um, exchange value of a commodity um, denied the in these times traditional answer that uh, the exchange value of a commodity is determined by the utility of the commodity. Uh, Adam Smith with his famous example of uh, water and diamonds, water is so um, um, useful for uh, man, but uh, has such a small exchange value. Diamonds have a uh, big exchange value and is not so useful. By this example, he denied the, the old utility theory and um, produced a new theory, this labor theory of value, that the labor which is necessary to produce uh, something that this labor is um, the, the reason for exchange value. This starting point of the classical uh, labor theory of value, Marx already criticized. He criticized the not critical treatment of labor, just to take labor as labor is something uh, very simple which uh, needs no more questions. Um, he starts with the twofold character of the commodity as a use value and exchange value and he simply uh, draw the consequence when the commodity has a twofold character then also the commodity producing labor has to be a twofold character. On the one hand, labor which 
um, produces use value. On the other hand, the same uh, labor constitutes the value. Labor which produces use value is the concrete labor, the labor we observe when we see how a person is working. The labor which produces value we cannot observe. And this now is the critical point against uh, the classics that labor which produces uh, value is abstract labor. Value is an abstraction. It is the, um, the abstraction from the different use values of different commodities. It is the abstraction um, which gives us an abstract economic uh, unity called value. And this is a pure social unity, this, this value, um, in uh, opposite to the use value. In, in use value, it depends from the natural um, attributes of the things. Value is a pure social uh, entity. And so the, the consequence, Marx draw, also abstract labor, which produces um, uh, value, is a pure social entity and uh, in, in no case something natural or something which exists in every society. In many Marxist uh, discussions, this twofold character of um, commodity producing labor is mentioned, but uh, it is not really used. It is, I, I think, in some respect, it is neglected, just uh, it is seen as a kind of refinement. The classics speak of labor as such. Marx divides uh, labor in concrete labor, producing use value, abstract labor, producing um, value. But this, this difference has a, a very fundamental meaning and Marx himself points to this fundamental meaning in Capital. When you read the, the first chapter of Capital, you find the nice uh, sentence there that Marx mentions this double character of um, commodity producing labor was first discovered by myself. It is the decisive point to understand anything in uh, political economy. It is very rare that Marx applauds to himself in, in such a way that he said, oh, I'm the first guy who discovered this and this is the decisive point. And when he is doing this, it must have a big importance for, for him. But when you look in, in a, a lot of literature, it is not clear why this is so, uh, it has such a big importance. And I try in, in this lecture here, I try to, to stress this importance. First, it is important because abstract labor is a purely social construction. It is not in any way natural. Uh, Marx hints when he speaks of uh, abstract labor, labor in the physiological sense as spending brain and muscles, is misleading because it is not a natural thing, it is a social thing, in so far that abstract labor is the recognition of the privately spent individual labor of, of the commodity producer as a part of social labor. The private producer produces a, a use value and then tries to sell this use value in the market. Only when this uh, selling process is successful, then his privately spent labor is recognized as a part of the total social labor. And what is the way in which this recognition 
is done, it is done in so far this privately spent labor is accepted as abstract labor. So abstract labor is not just a social construction, it is a social construction which connects the Robinsons of the um, bourgeois society with the, the universal dependence of this Robinson. So it is a decisive uh, social construction. But as, a, so, as, as a, such a social construction, it is not easily to fix or to, to measure. And this is also a, a big uh, point of weakness in, in a lot of um, traditional Marxist uh, debates and, and contributions that um, it is thought we can measure abstract labor just in hours with uh, uh, using our watches. But when we use our watch to measure labor time, which labor time do we measure then? We measure the labor time we can observe. We see someone is working, let us say a carpenter, producing a table. We measure he needs five hours for this table. But what then we had measured? We didn't measure abstract labor time. We measured the time of concrete labor which was necessary to produce this certain use value. The measure of abstract labor time is not possible in uh, labor magnitudes, it is only possible in money. And this is a, a decisive point which Marx stresses in, in the first volume of Capital in uh, chapter 3, where he introduces money as measure of value as a necessary not to avoid measure of value. Uh, and in his earlier uh, book about uh, the critique of political economy, this first two chapters which appeared in the year 1859, eight years before volume one of Capital, he explicitly speaks about that the immediate form of uh, existence of abstract labor is money. So this social uh, construction, abstract labor, we can only measure by, by money, not by uh, labor time. But this uh, abstract labor as a social construction also has consequences for what Marx calls substance of value. When you read Capital, very early in, in the first chapter, Marx uh, speaks uh, about the substance of value, that abstract labor is substance of value. And again, in, in many uh, contributions, this substance is understood as something which belongs to a single commodity. So we have this table produced as a commodity and somewhere inside, wherever, is a certain amount of the substance of value. But this is definitely not meant by Marx. Uh, already in, in the first few pages, he speaks of this substance as a common substance, not a substance you can find in an isolated um, um, commodity, a substance which is common in the exchange process when you exchange one commodity with another commodity. And this argument that you cannot speak of uh, the substance of an uh, isolated commodity, this is developed a little bit more extensively in his reworking manuscript when he reworked 
the first edition of uh, Volume 1 of Capital to come to the second edition. The second edition shows a lot of changes to the first edition and in this and especially in, in the first uh, chapters uh, dealing with value theory and there exists a, a very interesting um, manuscript in which Marx did the reworking and in which he gave commentaries to himself. Marx comments his own presentation in, in the first edition he uh, argues something is to be misunderstood and therefore I have to change this and this and uh, indeed you find such changes then in, in the second edition. This manuscript unfortunately until now is only published in the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, this new big edition of all uh, Marx and Engels uh, works and manuscripts which um, will not be such a small edition like the, the German MEV with uh, 43 volumes. Uh, when this new mega will be uh, finished it will include 114 volumes and there also this manuscript is published and unfortunately not translated but in um, this introduction I, I wrote and which will be in, in Croatian language uh, ready at the end of this month, I used this manuscript and gave also some, um, some quotes from this re regarding uh, the point I'm speaking here that substance, value substance is not an attribute of a single commodity, it is a common attribute. Because it is a, a common attribute, it's by, by the way, maybe this would be more interesting in, in the evening when I, I think it is the philosophical faculty. Yes, for philosophers uh, maybe it's, uh, it would be more, more interesting uh, that the, the notion of substance Marx uses in, in Capital, in some respect also provides a basic critic for the, um, the mainstream debate on substance uh, starting with Aristotle. Marx was, um, he estimated Aristotle very much and also in Capital in, in the footnotes you can find commentaries to, to Aristotle, but his notion of substance is definitely a critique of the discourse on, on substance starting with uh, Aristotle. But okay, this only as a, as a side remark because I'm not in a philosophical faculty here. Um, this new uh, idea, this new concept of, uh, of substance has a lot of consequences. Uh, now for, for the issues here, the, the most important consequence is that this substance as a relational substance is only visible, will only find a, a form of appearance in a relation. And this relation is what Marx calls the value form, the expression of value. The value of one commodity can only be expressed by a second commodity and this relation is the value form. In chapter one of uh, Capital, which is devoted to the commodity, this subsection on value form is the biggest subsection and it is also the subsection to which Marx devoted most of his time, which was uh, very often changed. He tried to be more precise. Uh, he starts in, in Grundrisse with it. It was reworked in, in the 59 text. It came in, in a much different form in the first edition of Capital. Then he changed a lot to, to the second edition. So this value form analysis had a big importance for Marx. 
but in the reception, in the literature about Marx, in the literature about capital, uh, we can say in the first 100 years it was nearly totally ignored. Only since the 1970s in, in some um, circles, in some uh, lines of discussion, this value form analysis plays um, an important role. In Germany, there starts uh, in, in late 60s, early 70s, this so-called Neue Marx Lektüre, new reading of Marx. And one of the important points for this new reading was to, to try to understand the importance of value form analysis. The, the older uh, reception focused on substance in a very limited way, just to stress the substance of value is labor, not utility. Okay, it's true, but it depends what kind of labor and what kind of substance. In value form analysis, you see that the special character of this substance as a relational substance makes necessary value form, the expression of substance. But to come to an adequate expression of substance, it is not uh, so easy. This is the, the content of this subsection of, uh, on, on value form. An adequate uh, expression of value you can find only in money. In so far, money is not just an additional to value or like is, it is seen in, in bourgeois mainstream economics, money is a tool in order to make life easier uh, if we would try to exchange uh, products directly, it would be very uh, difficult when the butcher comes with the steak to the baker, to the bakery, but the baker is a vegetarian, he doesn't want steak, uh, it's very complicated. Money makes uh, the life easier. This is the usual explanation when you are in a um, department on economics and you ask why do we use money, why, why we have money, then you will uh, get such explanations. Marx tries to show that the importance of money is much, much more fundamental than just a helper in, in everyday life. Value cannot exist, cannot become practically without relation to money. This is, by the way, also one of his main critics against Ricardo. Marx estimated Ricardo very much, much higher, I think, than he estimated Adam Smith. But in this point, he says, money, uh, uh, Ricardo doesn't understand the relation between value, labor, and money. That they are inseparably connected. Uh, Ricardo connects value and labor, like the bulk of traditional Marxism is also doing, but he sees not a necessary connection to, to money. And this is the point Marx stresses in his critique against Ricardo, you can find in the second book of uh, Theories of Surplus Value. So, in, in this Neue Marx Lecture in, in the 70s in Germany was the term coined monetary value theory to express this specificity of Marx value theory that there is an inseparable connection between value and money. And in, in my work, uh, among others, I tried to, um, to extend uh, this concept of monetary value theory. It's not a term coined by Marx. You will nowhere find uh, such a term in Marx. It is a, a term which tries to characterize uh, an important point in, in Marx uh, value theory. 
So, until now, oh, I see time is uh, running. Until now, I tried to, to show differences between Marx value theory and this classical labor theory of value and also the, uh, the dominant receptions of uh, value theory in, in Marxist uh, discussions. I spoke about uh, the, the scope which is different. I spoke um, about abstract, the, uh, ab about labor, that the, the, ter the notion of labor changed by Marx to, to abstract uh, labor and that this had also consequences for, um, for the notion of or the concept of uh, substance. Now I want uh, to come to two further uh, consequences. The one is fetishism and the other is impersonal rule. The uh, last subchapter of this first chapter on commodity in capital is called the uh, fetish uh, character of the commodity and its secret. And the, the notion commodity fetishism in the meantime is rather widespread, but uh, in, in many cases I think not very well understood. First, when we uh, talk about fetishism, we have to, to have in mind that in Marx days, fetishism means something else than fetishism mostly uh, means uh, uh, today. Today, when we hear, uh, when we speak about fetishism, our discussion is influenced by uh, f the, the studies of Sigmund Freud about fetishism we think of some sexual obsessions with ob objects and this is called fetishism. In Marx times, this notion of fetishism was completely unknown. Fetishism meant uh, some so-called primitive religion uh, views. Uh, these views, the European um, Conquerors found, for example, uh, in, in Africa, in some tribes, that they produced uh, little pieces of, uh, of wood or of leather, uh, painted it, and then they were uh, in fear of it because they thought that these things had magic forces, uh, they had power about uh, people, and you must be very um, cautious with it. And of course, the European uh, colonial powers took this as a proof for the primitivity of uh, such tribes. They produce a stick of wood and then they are in fear of it. So uh, European colonialism uh, is a good thing to bring culture, rationality to such uh, primitive uh, people. When Marx uses this term fetishism in capital, on the one hand it has a, a polemical quality. He tries to show to the bourgeois society, look, you think you are so enlightened, you are so rational, but at the core of uh, your society, in your economic system, you also have a certain kind of fetishism. So in some respect it was a, um, it, it had polemical reasons to use this word, but on the other hand it was also very precise to use this word. Why? Because there is really a kind of fetishism in, in the core of bourgeois society. The, the relations in a market society between producers are not immediate relation from person to person, 
they are relations mediated by things. In a market society, the private producers exchange their things. The, the social relation exists not between uh, the persons, it exists between the things. And by this, the things receive social attributes. The things are made by humans, of course. Uh, that they have social attributes is a consequence of the structure of uh, the market society. But nevertheless, these things and their attributes, you can uh, uh, see, you can encounter uh, in everyday life in bourgeois society. From the market movements, we are all dependent. The capitalist uh, um, entrepreneurs are dependent from these market movements of prices of commodities. They decide if they can make a profit or not. The, the employed persons who sell the labor power to uh, the capitalists are dependent because if their labor power is needed to make profit or not depends on these market movements. So, we are all submitted to this, um, to this rule of things. It is not an illusion, it is not an, a kind of ideology to, to say, oh, the things have social quality. No. In bourgeois society, they really have social quality, social attributes, because this society is structured in such a crazy way that humans who are dependent on each other are not in a direct contact, are not uh, discussing what they need, what they want to produce, what they are able to produce and so on. They are mediated by things. This mediation by things is not uh, gives the, the commodities this social attribute, independent social attributes, and because the commodities need for their relation money, money is the most social thing in bourgeois society. In, uh, in Grundrisse, Marx uh, uh, used the nice sentence to say, when we have money, it means that we can put our society in our bag. We have the society as a thing which we can put in, in our bag. And this is exactly the point that the thing, money, no matter if it is a, a gold coin or a paper printed uh, by the central bank, that this thing has social power. So fetishism is not an illusion. It is not a wrong consciousness, uh, ideology or something. In the bourgeois society, in a capitalist market society, this fetishism, the rule of things, really uh, is really existent. It is a reality. It has an elusive side, but just at a different point. This fetishism seems to be natural. It seems to be unavoidable. And here Marx uh, speaks of, uh, in, in volume, in, in chapter one in Capital, he's, he used the term phantasmagorie, a fantastic thing, an elusive thing, you can say, but not for the bourgeois society. There it's a reality, but for the idea that fetishism we have in every society. It is not to avoid. 
A nice example for this fetishism in, in the elusive sense is Adam Smith. Adam Smith, in his um, important work about the wells of nations, discusses uh, a lot of issues which are unusual for, for modern economic textbooks. For example, he discusses what is the difference between a human and an animal. And uh, the answer of uh, Adam Smith is the difference between a human being and an animal is the exchange. Animals, they struggle for things. Maybe they kill each other. But you never saw animals exchange things. Two dogs, maybe they, they struggle about a bone. But you never saw them exchange one big bone against two small bones or something like this. This is an attribute you find only with humans. So to exchange things, to produce commodities, this makes humans to humans. And this is a, a perfect illustration for this kind of fetishism in the elusive sense. What we find in the bourgeois society, commodity producing, is generalized to a condition humaine, to a, to a condition of human life. In this sense, fetishism is something what is wrong, what is an illusion. But in bourgeois society, fetishism is a reality. And this reality, I, I already gave, gave the hint, so I can make this last point very short. And this reality can be seen very uh, clearly in the impersonal relations of domination which are characterizing bourgeois society or capitalist societies. In all pre-capitalist societies, we have personal forms of domination and of rule. Just think of the example slave and master. The slave was personal property of the master. The master as a person had power, had, uh, uh, was dominating the slave. When you compare this with uh, modern relations, let us say the, the modern wage laborer and the capitalist, there is no personal rule, uh, personal domination in this sense. The laborer has a treaty with the capitalist. He gives his uh, or her labor force and receives a certain salary. And this treaty can be solved. The laborer can uh, go out of the, the capitalist uh, um, enterprise and can do something else. What the slave isn't, was not able to do. He was the personal property. So, in, in so far, in, in capitalist relations, we have not personal domination, personal rule. And a lot of bourgeois thinkers, philosophers, um, political scientists see this already as the absence of, um, of domination and of rule. In capitalist society, we are all equal and free uh, citizens. We have a government which we elect uh, by, by our votes in, in, uh, in the elections. Um, there is a rule of the government, but this is not a personal rule. It is uh, just that uh, people give power for a certain time. I have a treaty with a capitalist for a certain time. I'm ready to follow the orders of the capitalist, but there is not a, a rule like uh, slave and master. 
Marx doesn't deny this, he, he stress this absence of personal rule, but he denies that this means the absence of any rule, of any domination, instead of personal rule. Capitalism is characterized by impersonal rule. You are ruled by structures, you are submitted to certain structures which you cannot avoid. In the, uh, with the wage laborer, it is very clear what uh, this means. The wage laborer can solve the, the labor treaty with a single capitalist, of course. But as a wage laborer who has no other property than the own uh, labor force, the wage laborer is dependent that he or she will find a capitalist to whom the, the labor force can be sold. So, what is uh, a remarkable uh, difference between ancient slavery and modern uh, wage uh, salary? Both the slave and the modern wage laborer is exploited. But the ancient slave tries to, ex to escape, he tries to to flew uh, from, uh, from the master. The modern wage laborer is looking for a capitalist so that he can sell his labor power to him. The one tries to escape, the other tries to find someone who is exploiting him. And this is just the consequence of this impersonal rule. There is a, a society formed by independent producers. It is by the state fully guaranteed that everybody has his or her uh, property. The, the property is secured by the state and you have the right to valorize your property in every way you can do. Okay, but for one big class, the only possibility to valorize the, the property is to sell his or her labor force. And so, by the rule of this structure, people try to get exploited while in, in ancient times people try to, uh, to escape from exploitation. But this, uh, to be submitted to this impersonal rule, holds not only for the wage laborers, it holds also for the capitalists. The capitalists are also submitted to this impersonal rule. The capitalists uh, in, in their enterprises try not only to reach profit, they try to reach maximum profit. They do this not out of personal greediness. Maybe some persons show this greediness, but this is not the, the decisive point. Even if you are a very ascetic uh, person, when you become a capitalist, you are forced to try to find the maximum profit in order that you can maintain the competition with other capitalists, that you have enough money for investments to modernize your, um, your machines, to, to conquer new markets. If you don't do this, if you are ready to stay with what you have, you will be lost in a competitive capitalist market. So, also this ruling class, the capitalists, are submitted to impersonal rule. This is something very different from pre-capitalist uh, societies. Now, this means not that we should feel pity 
for um, for the uh, bad uh, situation of the capitalists, but it should direct di direct our political critique to capitalism. When we critic, when we we formulate uh, critic against capitalism, we should always think it is not the point of persons that we uh, have to criticize how greedy, how mean the capitalists are. Maybe they are even nice, uh, uh, friendly persons. Our critique has to be, uh, has to aim the basic structures which provoke, which makes necessary certain um, patterns of behavior. And these structures, they start not, I, I focused now on, on um, capitalist relations, but they start not only in capitalist relations, they start already in commodity relations. And this is the last remark, and then I, I really uh, stop this lesson. The critique Marx formulates against capitalism is a critique which starts not only at the capitalist relations that uh, we have to get rid of the capitalists, of capitalist uh, exploitation. The critique Marx formulates already starts with commodity production. It starts with value theory, impersonal rule starts already when we produce uh, our, our use values in the form of commodities. Um, in so far, and this maybe is even a, an actual discussion, maybe a lot of, uh, of things um, sound to you rather abstract, rather theoretical, uh, what I um, introduced here, but they have very practical um, consequences. When we really want to get off um, capitalism, to get rid of uh, capitalism, then we also have to get rid of commodity production. So, kinds of market socialism, which were discussed in, in the left uh, in the last 100 years, at least from uh, the perspective of Marxian analysis, are doomed to fail just to, to reproduce the old capitalist structures. Uh, and in so far, to get rid of capitalism means also to get rid of commodity production. And uh, I think this is the political clue of this uh, Marxian value theory, which I tried to, to highlight in some aspects uh, at, uh, at this lesson here. Thank you very much that you paid for so long time your attention to this. <laughs>